Welcome to A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. I'm going to go over these notes today with you. This is one of my favorite short stories, and I'm excited to talk about Flannery O'Connor with you. Um, she's actually from Georgia. She's from Andalusia, Georgia. Um, she grew up on a peacock farm. You can actually go to her, her house, um, and you can see the peacocks in her picture right here. But because she grew up in the South, she had a very colorful lens for writing, um, and it was a Southern lens. And so she pulls that a lot of that into her writing. She pulls the grotesque in. She has local color, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, she was Catholic, so she has a very Catholic perspective on her writing. And a lot of her writing has um, religious allusions in it. That's A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-S, allusions. Um, very humorous, um, strong characterizations. And Clarence O'Connor... She was definitely very cynical. She had a very comic and tragic vision to all of her writings, and she had shocking plots, and I think that's one reason I fell in love with her writing is because you don't ever know what's going to happen with some of her characters. Um, she goes with shock value, and that's where the gothic and grotesque comes into play. So let's talk about the gothic and literature for a second. Um, you know, it started in the 18th century, and this, this is talking about the Gothic in literature, not Southern Gothic. We're going to throw Southern into the mix in a minute. But the Gothic is going to be definitely particularly American. And yes, you can think Edgar Allan Poe because what happened in the 18th century is you had these transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and they were writing about the beauty of nature they basically quit their day jobs and went and sat in the woods and said, thought, you know, wrote about how beautiful nature was. And ain't nobody got time for that, said Edgar Allan Poe. So he decided to write about the decay of nature and how ugly it was. And so that's where we get our gothic um, in literature. And that's why it's particularly American. And you think about gothic architecture um, suspense, the supernatural, irony, unusual events in the plot. Um, so that's going to be your gothic and you'll, you'll get more into gothic and, um, your, your 10th grade classes probably. Um, you'll get into the romanticism of the gothic era, but we are going to get into the Southern gothic, which if you think about gothic, which it's horror, violence, um, the architecture. You take that and you put the word Southern in front of it, and it creates this eerie feeling of the South. And so Southern Gothic is going to be particularly for the Southern part of the United States here. You're going to think about um, your swamp lands. You're going to think about your old dilapidated buildings in old rundown country um, towns. Um, you're going to think about old fences down here, rundown roads, with bicycles left down on the road. And the reason we get into the Southern Gothic with Flannery O'Connor is because of what was going on during that time that she was writing. And so a lot of her writing is um, very political, which most authors' writings are political. But during her writing... She really was giving the middle finger to people who didn't believe in equality. And so we'll get into that in a minute with this short story you're going to read today when we talk about the Old South versus the New South. But when you think about the Southern Gothic, I want you to focus on like what we would consider to be redneck in the South. That is the Southern Gothic. It's that hillbilly, swampland kind of feel to it. And she basically makes that grotesque. So um, the grotesque is going to be a feature of what you're reading today in the Southern Gothic. It's going to be situations, places, or stock characters that possess disturbing features. Um, I mean, it could be like a physical disturbing feature. Maybe they have a characteristic about them that's very disturbing. Um, I know in A Good Man It's Hard to Find, you have a man who has a sweatshirt on that doesn't fit and his belly's hanging out like that should stand out to you 
or maybe a character such as June Star in A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um, her name actually reflects who she is. She's a star. She's June. She's a diva. Um, so just think about the disturbing features of each character. Next is racial bigotry, which causes a lot of conflict in Flannery O'Connor's short stories. Um, so we are going to pay attention to that. And then O'Connor's unexpected actions. And he, that's her shock value. You just never know what she's going to write. Um, the grotesque in Flannery O'Connor, she states that in each story and action that is totally unexpected yet totally believable, often an act of violence, violence being the situation that best reveals what we are essentially. So this kind of goes back to where we've talked about in class about dreams and how, you know, sometimes we dream about the things that we desire the most and it's things that we don't necessarily want to talk about as humans. Well, she's kind of going on the grotesque with that and she's saying that these acts of violence are basically situations that reveal what we truly think about others um, and it's totally believable too. So she doesn't go off the chain with it too far, um, but it's going to be believable situations. So in A Good Man is Hard to Find, there are several different um, texts that you can find this out of. I have an anthology of Flannery O'Connor in my classroom, and that's where I pull this short story from. But anytime you see Flannery O'Connor, you'll probably see a peacock with her because her feathers or whatnot. If you look at this image, you'll see that. Um, but that's because uh, she did grow up on a peacock farm. Um, so the themes in A Good Man is Hard to Find. You have good versus evil, always. That's the best situational archetype to go to, remember. Um, next is faith versus doubt. She was Catholic. She was very religious. And so she had characters that would be often questioning their faith. Um, you'd have other characters that are strong in their faith that meet these characters who are questioning their faith. And so there are different plot twists you would do on that. Next is old versus new ways as seen in the family so okay in a good man is hard to find um, the grandmother is always like well back in my day blah 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 and i know you guys have heard that before that's exactly what she's talking about here so back in my day we did blah 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 and so the family is you know going to want to do one thing and the grandmother's going to want to do the other so that's going to be old versus new ways as seen in the family then we get into old versus new south and this is really important so if you're tuning me out right now at least listen to this so old south is going to be people who believed in slavery who didn't support equality um, new south is going to be people that believed in equality and they believed in that that you know the breaking of segregation and so you have the Old South mentality versus the New South mentality. And so, of course, the grandmother in this short story, she is elderly. She believes in the old ways. So she is going to be very much Old South. And so Flannery O'Connor is going to make some disturbing statements in this text. And she does use the N-word. And I say that she uses the N-word to make the grandmother look um old south and she does it so she looks disgusting and grotesque and that's going to be a way that Flannery O'Connor basically is giving people who believe in the old south the middle finger she's giving them the middle finger this is her way of writing and doing that so she's saying if you believe in slavery and you know basically keeping people down like that then you are sick. Um, and so just notice that when the grandmother starts talking about how she sees a little cute pickaninny sitting on the front porch, not wearing any shoes, etc. And that's going to be very flooring to read. However, grandmother says, if I could paint a picture, I'd paint that. Well, you think pictures are pretty and you want them in your house, that's not a pretty picture. Why would the grandmother say that? Well, it's because she lives in the Old South mentality. Um, and Flannery O'Connor says that's sick. Okay, that's grotesque, and that's evil. Um, so basically, in A Good Man, we question, is there such thing as a good man? And I'm not talking about, like, in a, as in a relationship. I'm talking about as in, like, a good human. Is there a good, a good thing is a such a good thing as a good man as in human all right next so let's look at the close reading 
It's going to be the local color. So what is local color? That's going to be something that would only be familiar with the people that live in the area. So for example, when I first came to Bremen, somebody said something about a people pleaser and I was like, do what? A people pleaser? I have no idea what y'all are talking about. And then I found out it was the local gas station. Like everybody in Bremen knows about people pleaser, except I did not know about people pleaser, but now I do. So that's what we call local color. Um, also, the people's last names, like the so-and-sos, are going to know the so-and-sos, okay? Strong characterization. Think about the characters' names. Pay attention to that. Flannery O'Connor uses names, and they are so important. Um, next is humor. You're going to laugh at some moments when you're reading Flannery O'Connor. Catholic perspective. Pay attention to her religious comments throughout and then the Southern Gothic and Grotesque, of course, is throughout. You've got the dilapidated buildings, the Old South versus New South. All right, so the characters in A Good Man is Hard to Find. It's going to be the grandmother, and we don't know her actual name. She goes by the grandmother, and there's a reason for that. It's just very vague, okay? We've got the mother, and then we've got Bailey, which is going to be the father. We've got John Wesley. He's the son. Also, John Wesley... He's also the founder of the Methodist Church, which is really interesting. So pay attention to this character. June Starr, she's going to be the, the daughter. So she, her, bro, she's bro, her, her brother is John Wesley. So June Starr, her name sounds just like what it sounds like. She acts like a diva. She's a star. Next, you've got Red Sammy. Um, he owns the Barbecue Butts place. He is straight up redneck, or so Flannery O'Connor wants you to believe. Um and then we have the misfit, and the misfit is actually going to probably represent the freak in each of us. And so you think about being odd, um, that's the misfit. He is misunderstood, perhaps. Um, so yeah, we don't know his real name either. He's just the misfit. So how is each character awful in his own way, and who is the real misfit is what we need to be asking ourselves. All right, so I wanted to give you a quick visual on the journey this family is taking. It's the 1950s. We have an evolving transportation system. So I want you to imagine this family getting in this one car and they drive from Atlanta to Florida, okay? So you've got the dad driving, you've got the mom in the front seat holding a newborn baby, and then you've got John Wesley, June Starr, and the grandmother sitting in the back seat. And oh, you can't forget that the grandmother sneaks her cat into the back seat, and the cat's name is Pity Sing. And so I want you to think about the name of the cat too, because all the Pity Sings gets us in trouble, definitely. So just keep that in mind. But I can't imagine being crammed into this car back in the day with all those people on a road trip. So what is the journey here? Is there a family breakdown? Is it from the literally leaving the Old South to the New South? Is it the search for Christ? Is it the misfit's failed journey to redemption? Like the misfit is like really confused in his faith. And so we, we understand that, especially towards the end. Again, so the misfit is going to represent the freak in all of us. And Flannery O'Connor, she says, you know, it's when we're afflicted with the doctrine of being perfect in our human nature that the vision of the freak in fiction is so disturbing. So, like, what does she mean by that? The freak in modern fiction is usually disturbing to us because he keeps us from forgetting that we share in his state. So, like... That's going to be like all these dainty people out there saying that they're not strange or weird. Like, we're all really weird. Like, we can't even define normal. You know, what's normal to me is not normal to you. So, um, she's basically trying to get you to identify, like, the oddities in yourself. Um, so, Flannery O'Connor's God. Um, I want you to look at this sign right here. This, these signs were very common. Um... Uh, along the road as you travel and you know what we have them now today like go into Statesboro when I was working on my doctorate I drive down south all the time you could see signs like this like um they're not exactly like this but it's you know similar it's, they're very similar even if you like go to Orlando a lot and you're going down to Disney World they have these signs all along the road 
um, anti-abortion campaigns, um, God is coming. Um, and so that's going to reflect on the South again with O'Flannery O'Connor's religion. And she says, while the South is not Christ-centered, it is certainly Christ-haunted. And she doesn't mean anything bad by that. But what she does mean is that um, people don't necessarily believe in their faith like they should, and they, they're hypocrites. And so you might kind of hear the grandmother run her mouth a little bit in this story, and she is quite the hypocrite, as we will see. Um, but here are some more road signs that you would have seen along the way. Um, you know, every eye shall see him, Jesus the Lord coming from heaven. God is not mocked. A life of sin reaps everlasting punishment. And so the, the, you have to know the misfit sees these signs all the time. So he's probably questioning himself. All right, I'm going to end with this slide. Um, the action of grace in territory is largely held, largely held by the devil. And so what is O'Connor getting at with her Christian mystery here? Um, well, you can look in this picture right here. You see the ray of light coming through in this old rundown road. Um, you've got an abandoned bicycle, yet the light is shining through. Um, she means that we have to do something called pass by the dragon in order to basically obtain our journey and so what does she mean by passing the dragon she means like passing by the devil like at some point we're all gonna face the devil or sin of in some fashion but it's how you handle it is what she's trying to say as that action of grace um but that's what she refers to as we have to pass by the dragon and so the fact that I like this image here because you see the light shining through, but that yet there's darkness, there's the abandoned bike, there's a road, there's a journey. It's like if you can get through the darkness, you can get to the light, okay, if you just keep your eye on the light. And so that's really what um, O'Connor is getting at with a lot of the points in her short stories. And so I hope you enjoy reading A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um it is, it gets better towards the end, but don't flip to the end because you will ruin it for yourself. So anyways, let me know if you have questions. You can always send me an email.